to the leader of the Korahites, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habit, habit, habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. The word of God for the people of God. This morning we celebrate Thanksgiving. In that spirit, our next text may seem a bit strange for the occasion. It's appointed by the lectionary, which is an ancient way to structure readings and worship centering on what are deemed important parts and stories of the Bible. It's a three-year cycle with four Testament per week, one each from the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Gospels, and the letters of the New Testament. On this Sunday of the year, one week before we celebrate the reign of Christ, chosen texts are often about hard times, our need for Christ to reign. I value the lectionary for church unity and for challenge in texts I might not choose. (laughs) It's a starting point. It's an open discussion that I could change and uh, adapt given concerns of the day. So why these texts then as we celebrate Thanksgiving? It is also 100 years since the World War I armistice. And I hear you all shared a powerful moment last week when Chrissy was praying in that spirit and our beloved friends across the street had their bells start tolling at the 11th hour. I've read a lot about World War I recently and I've tried to glean from Flanders' field of the past what might be guidance and inspiration for our present. A connection with what St. Mark is about to say may become obvious. We might say a central question for us today is how do we move from such great devastation to grateful celebration? How do we move from such great devastation to grateful celebration? Hear what the Spirit may say. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, then when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, Do not be alarmed, this must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then 
they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the God in Scripture to the ends of heaven. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Scholars call this text Mark's Apocalypse. Beyond wars and rumors of war, he envisions more violence and persecution and family members betraying one another in all kinds of suffering. Mark's people lived through military assault on Jerusalem and their sacred temple torn down. You see, friends, He doesn't forecast future events as though calling us to try to enact that. Prophecy is a literary form used to frame and to speak to current experience. At the Wailing Wall, we will see those pilgrims among us in a few months, and we will stand on the huge foundation stones that remain from that Jewish temple. Yes, Mark's people knew all about suffering and persecution and wars and resulting famine and the destruction of families. And sadly, we might say some things in human experience often seem much the same. As bad as World War I became, it started with glorious parties in every country, parades and jaunty expectations like they were sending their soccer team to the next World Cup. Surely this bit of fun would end in a few months with spoils of easy victory. Enemy royal families, you may know, were actually cousins, all come from Queen Victoria. Causes of war were so foolish and avoidable. Strategies and tactics were so incompetent and wasteful. Trenches quickly spread. Casualties soared. Horror continued beyond imagination for four long years. Human powers of freedom and intellect and reason employed for destruction literally blew people's minds. So many shells and bullets cratered the land that all along the front literally nothing survived. No trees, no plants, no animals except rats. In one futile battle, British soldiers attacked through deep mud into rolls of barbed wire. The slaughter so horrified German machine gunners, they simply stopped firing as the British walked back to their own side. War ended with Belgium literally and figuratively raped repeatedly. Germany in utter famine, Russia in revolution, soldiers and citizens in all nations so disturbed by the experience that governments throughout Europe tottered. A great poet of the war, Wilfred Owen, was killed just days before the end in The Parable of the Old Man and the Young. Owen captures the heart of the horror and its cause and maybe inspires a desire. Abraham and measured motive in all times through allusion to the scriptural story of Abraham and Isaac, the parable of the old man and the young. So Abram rose and clave the wood and went and took the fire with him and a knife. And as they sojourned both of them together, Isaac the firstborn spake and said, My father, behold the preparations, fire and iron, but where the lamb for this burnt offering? Then Abram bound the youth with belts and straps and builded parapets and trenches there and stretched forth the knife to slay his son when, lo, an angel called him out of heaven, saying, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. Behold, a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Offer the ram of pride instead. Offer the ram of pride instead of him. But the old man would not so, but slew his son and half the seed of Europe, one by one. As much as the First World War sucked in people all around the globe, continued into the second and shaped the course of the whole 20th century, still, I wonder 
Are causes and casualties and stresses from then relevant even now? Maybe we should just let it go. Maybe. Then I remember some good friends back in Marshall. Strong family, committed parents, loving home, success in the eyes of society. He flew for United Airlines and for the Air National Guard A-10 squadron based in Battle Creek. In the Iraq War, flying low and slow and very heavily armed, their job was to destroy anything that moved. And he said they did it well. And once while on a few weeks of leave, he struggled mightily with all he saw through his gun sights and triggered. Our lively young children holding conversation short. Still I see him shifting unsettled, holding back tears that betrayed deeper pain as if every bullet and every bomb exploding on the outside did so on the inside as well. Within a year of 27 pilots in that squadron, all but two had broken marriages and families, some with a complex of other addictions. Casualties of war included his wife, whose lupus raged amid stresses out of control, their 12-year-old son suddenly man of the house, their daughter eight, their second son four. As we observe the end of World War I, friends, we see how similar horrors continue still. So today I honor and I lament, but I don't intend to debate pacifism or just use of force or any particular conflict. Causes and justification and conduct of war should always be soberly considered. And many people I have known who prove the most careful, judicious, suspicious, and hesitant to go to war are career officers who spend their lives around it. Today, I really want to find good news, especially for people among us who face horrors in their own lives, veterans, and all the casualties of war that they know and love, people who've known persecution and prejudice like you and me, traumatic violence, or who face effects of illness beyond their imagination. Good news for people in Northern California who've lived through something akin to John Milton's famous Paradise Lost. So it looked and felt this week after raging fire consumed everything in its path, a war zone, one leader called it, as human body counts keep rising. Good news for people in Yemen and so many other places where Owen's parable of the old man and the young keeps getting relived as horrific human proclivity for destruction never seems to end. Friends, here is the good news. God promises, I will come to you in the lowly silence, in fear or despair and shadows of the night, bringing light, bringing strength and healing, freedom and peace the world cannot give. God is our refuge and strength in times of trouble, the psalmist assures. Though the climate of earth should change, though highest social institutions like mountains shake and quake into chaos like the sea, though nations totter and tremble amid tumult, God is ever in our midst. The Lord of heaven, family with us. The God of Jacob, who knew a thing or two about, you know, family conflict and greedy choices and injurious consequences. The God of Jacob and Rachel and Leah is our refuge too. Come, behold how holy love makes wars cease. Be still. The Hebrew word there isn't really like, you know, sitting on the beach watching the sunset feel the breeze. It's bold. It's strong, it's silencing chaos like Aslan's lioness roar or Dumbledore's bellow amid excited Hogwarts students or guns on the Western Front firing incessantly in the final hours so they didn't have to carry the shells home suddenly quiet as the, strucks, as the clocks struck 11. It's Jesus' voice, friends, 
gentle, steadfast, clear amid anxiety and loss and confusion and illusions of grandeur like the old temple in their holy city. Resounding from his disciples to Mark's people, to me and you over all the centuries, saying, you will hear of wars. You will hear of earthquakes and famine and nations falling and people claiming to be Savior as if they are my very presence and power. But don't be deceived. Do not despair. Amid the suffering, it is just the beginning. Where sun is darkened by smoke and ash of war or wildfires, where the moon is gone, where wishes and dreams seem like stars fallen, even trust in heavenly powers shaken, then you will see me coming. Then God will send angels to gather an ordinary people like you and me at the farthest ends of life in earth and in heaven. Angels like Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. The quote on the bulletin cover should have Pierre in front of the name. I forgot that a little bit. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a French Jesuit priest. He served as a medic stretcher bearer mostly among the Zouave North African regiments. He would say mass for soldiers right in the trenches as shells exploded all around. Once he crawled into no man's land after dark, right in front of an enemy machine gunner to come for a wounded soldier. And he appeared at dawn with a dead man on his back. Amid horrors of gas and human stench, he found it possible, he says, to breathe the air of heavenly love Born in such hours of crisis that love always lives within us, he stresses. And when it does, we see through the scab of banalities and the crust of convention, as he called it, to the deeper layers of humanity beneath the daily monotony. We know what really matters. And we pursue in in gratitude holiness that can only be fulfilled in the fullness of peace. In gratitude to God, we said, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in daily tasks and live holy and joyful lives. The truth is that after World War I, many prejudices between races and classes simply would not stand. Women took major steps toward liberation, including the right to vote. For all the horrors of war, friends, the truth is the military remains about the most integrated and equitable institution of our society. Yes, inhumanities and atrocities occur. And we hear stories like George Coles, a British prisoner in World War I. His plane got shot down, captured, held for months back in Germany. In the final days, Bolsheviks took over his camp, barely holding chaos at bay. In a way, the security of prison bars were his sanctuary. On November 12th, parades and crowds passed beneath his window, so he dropped some Red Cross biscuits through the bars to the streets below. Within minutes, starving children massed, and they passed 10 boxes of their precious rations. Angels of God, who is our refuge and strength in times of trouble. At men's group this past Tuesday, one of our friends told us about a person who walked across Afghanistan, even through the most violent parts, and wherever he went, he received gracious welcome, shelter, refuge, and food. Because strange as it may seem in such a bloody and chaotic land, hospitality, even for alien strangers, is at the heart of their life and faith. Another friend was moved by a book about cleanup of the space shuttle Columbia in Texas years ago. 1,500 people from around the country came to sift through all the material and the human remains. In that part of rural Texas, of course, there weren't any hotels or restaurants, so people took them into their very own homes. And at the VFW Hall, the VFW Hall, they served over 50,000 meals. And he said they cracked 25,000 eggs 
He affirmed that again this morning as he served our own breakfast. (laughs) You will hear of wars, of stars falling from heaven, and then you will see the Son of Humanity coming in glory. In a few moments, we'll give thanks for and we will dedicate our East Transept Chapel space over here. People have given others effort, expertise, and money so that right here, others who are a bit shell-shocked by events in life may find a refuge in times of trouble, may hear good news proclaimed for them. May the holy presence of love be felt as lives get healed and inspired and transformed. Among these arches, these chairs, this floor of stone, here may we be still, and may sacred hope and committed purpose in Christ move us all deeply from pride, from greed, from foolish arrogance and selfishness, to humble, grateful, generous thanksgiving. And then in a few days, friends, we'll be gathering around our other tables with family and friends or neighbors. Pilgrims, you know, long ago fled persecution. They survived months aboard a tiny ship, even through winter just offshore. Something like half of them died. They faced potential enemies, then overcame fear to share a feast. Christian, Native American, both the God of Jacob and the God of Wampanoag Pipil was in the midst of those people that day in that village. And so may the Holy Spirit be as abundant for us in our gatherings as the cornucopia arrangement here up in our chancel. You know, trenches in the war of words have been dug throughout our society. They may pass right through our tables, right through our own hearts. Maybe some people dear to us won't even come for our gathering this year, casualties of conflict in one form or another. And for some, we know that as this weekend begins the holiday season, it is a difficult time. I wonder what Thanksgiving was like here a hundred years ago, after all fell quiet on the Western Front and it was still. Dear friends, this I believe, our ability to give thanks and to live with gratitude and good times is stronger and deeper and richer in God's grace for all the tragedy that we've known, the trauma that may linger, and the people we love still, to whom we open our hearts. For what, for whom, do we give thanks? Even in our most difficult times of life, The Spirit of Jesus Christ who gave his life to love, even through what were the trenches of his day, rises again within each of us and among us all and comes to sit at our tables. If it was true for me, it can in World War I. If it's true in Afghanistan, then just maybe it can be true in your home and in mine. Listen for his voice of grace and peace, bold, strong, gentle, steadfast, clear, and be still. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars and so much other suffering, Christ says, do not be deceived, do not despair. You will see God come with great power of compassionate love and the glory of sacrificial service then God will send out angels to the ends of the earth and human experience. Just maybe, me and you. Thanks be to God. Amen.